start with a talk by Melanie Vandenbroek of the Royal Museums Greenwich. And her title is, Whatever Shines Should Be Observed, Astronomical Prize Medals. Welcome. Um, thank you very much to John for introducing me, to Ian for inviting me. Um, but two people here really need uh, particular thanks for me. One is Shan Prosser, um, who allowed me to delve into the archives of the Royal Astronomical Society, and I'm entirely indebted to her for anything I've found. And the second person is Marek Kukula, uh, who is the person who initiated me to the love of astronomy. Although I cannot pretend I know very much about astronomy, I'm just a kind of observer from the realm of uh, art history, as it were. So, um, to start, astronomers' lives and work involve observing the furthest reaches of the universe, peering through unfathomable distances at objects that are almost inconceivably large and often extraordinary faint. And yet, they also enjoy the pleasures of small, legible, handheld objects, be it as connoisseurs, recipients, or both. This talk considers the creation of the first two medals of the Royal Astronomical Society, the Gold Medal and the Jackson Gold Medal. The first helped define the society, while the lengthy debates about the latter reveal the complexity of commissioning a medal that appropriately commemorates and encourages achievements in the specialised field of astronomy. When the Society was founded in January 1820, its goals were to be, amongst other things, the formation of a complete catalogue of stars and other bodies, the education of observers, the diffusion of information, the formation of a library, and the proposal of prize questions. The latter was not in itself new. Prize questions had been instigated by the Académie des Sciences in Paris in 1719, while in Britain, the Royal Society had been rewarding the highest scientific achievements with the Copley Prize since 1731, thanks uh, to a bequest from Sir Godfrey Copley, and the prize had been permuted into the Copley Medal here on screen. The idea of the Copley Medal was actually the suggestion of the Royal Society's vice president, the astronomer and numismatist, Sir Mark Martin Fawkes, who said that a, I quote, loadable emulation might be excited among men of genius to try their invention, who in all probability may never be moved for the sake of lucre. So his idea was that um, the emulation wouldn't be about the money, but would be about the prize. It was then re resolved, I quote, to award the medal to the author of the most important scientific discovery or contribution to science <laughs> by experiment or otherwise. So a beautiful object to be cherished and display, displayed proudly uh, in one's home. Likewise, the creation of a prize medal was considered by the newly founded Astronomical Society of London from the very outset. At the third ordinary meeting of its council on 12 May 1820, it was decided to investigate the expanse of a medallic die with appropriate devices and inscriptions and soon resolved that the head of Newton be one of the designs engraved thereon. By July 1821, a medalist had been selected to execute the dies, which are here on screen now uh, in the library. And by July, um, and those dies were to be executed for 30 guineas, which is a considerable amount of money for the time. The medalist was George Mills, who was of our appropriate uh, choice. He was considered by the painter Benjamin West to be the foremost uh, medalist in England. So the obverse of his medal for the Astronomical Society bears, as intended, the bust of uh, Newton, who was an apt embodiment of the ethos of the society, for his discoveries, and I know I don't really need to introduce any of that to you, had far-reaching consequences for the field of astronomy. The import of his oeuvre is summarised in the medal's inscription in exergue below the bust, Nubem Palanti Mathesi, Mathematics or Science Dispelling Clouds, that is, Reason Dispelling Ignorance. This aphorism formed part of Edmund Halley's Ode to Newton, published as an epigraph to Newton's Principia. While there is no trace of its subject being discussed in the society's archives, the significance and appeal of the medal's reverse is immediately obvious. It represents, and again, I don't need to introduce it to you, William Herschel's 40-foot telescope, then the largest of the world. 
A self-taught pioneering astronomer and instrument maker, Herschel was the first president of the new society. German-born, he'd moved to England in 1757, where he had an embarrassingly successful career as a musician, but progressively neglected earthly music for that of the spheres. His study of the construction of the heavens soon commanded the respect of uh, professional astronom astronomers. And in 1781, as you all know, his discovery of Uranus earned him the Copley Medal, immediate admission within the Royal Society's rank, and from 1782, the patronage of George III. The distinctive shape of the Great 40 telescope was widely published in both specialist and more popular illustrations. While it had not proved as successful as anticipated, its size making it unwieldy to maintain and set up for regular observations, the colossal instrument was the talk of Europe scientists visited by the leading figures of the time and became a tourist attraction. On the medal, it stands for the astronomer himself, his inventiveness in telescopic instrumentation, and his own consuming scrutiny of the heavens. Herschel's motto above, quick quid nitet notandum, whatever shines should be observed, suggests a relentless sweeping of the night sky that led him to catalogue an unprecedented number of objects and make some of the most provocative contributions to astronomy. Now, it is opposite that it would figure on the reverse of a medal portraying Newton for Herschel's advances in intr instrumentation had been inspired by Newtonian telescopes. What is remarkable, however, is that the medal signified that the achievements of the latter were thus equal to those of the former. Now, Herschel had died on 25th of August, 1822. And while it remains to be found whether the reverse design was chosen before or after his death, the latter would signal the society's desire to honor Herschel's legacy in a durable way. In the report of the Society's third AGM in January 1823, it was declared that his name was so intimately connected with the progress of modern astronomy and the science had been so eminently enriched by his discoveries and researches that it could not fail to shed a luster upon the society over which he presided. Significantly, as you all know, the medal's reverse would become the emblem and motto of the society. Medal making, designing, decision by committee can be a very slow process. And it would not be until December 1823 that the decision was taken to strike the medals at the Royal Mint. The first medals were finally awarded at the AGM in February 1824, two weeks after the medalist's untimely death. In 1831, the society was attributed Royal Charter and renamed Royal Astronomical Society of London. This called for an updated medal design, commissioned to William Wyon since George Mills had died, chief engraver of the Royal Mint. Wyon did not simply modify the inscription from Astronomical Society of London to Royal Astronomical Society. He created a new bust of Newton, younger, slender, looking to the left rather than the right. The head is more spatially balanced within the composition, resting on a wider field. The inscription better distributed around the bust, its lettering more refined and legible. On the reverse, the telescope too was modified to reflect closely the design of John Barlow's print of 1795 by placing the large structure within a landscape. And then, thus the telescope appears better grounded rather than just hovering on the field as if suspended in mid-air as it did in the previous medal. While the RS Gold Medal, as you know, is still awarded to this day, on four occasions, a member of the, of the Society's Council, Arthur Cowper Reynard, tried to discontinue its existence between 1886 and 1890. Not only was he in, unsuccessful in his endeavor, another award medal would soon be produced, although its conception took some 36 years of gestation and involved a number of women, something one might have then called a rare astronomical event. Hannah Jackson was a somewhat eccentric lady of comfortable, comfortable means who, through the lifelong passion of her uncle and father, both fellows of the RAS, had herself developed an interest in astronomy. In 1861, she wrote to the Society, offering the capital sum of 300 pounds, its dividends to be used after her death as the award of cash prize and medals. 
This she specified was to be awarded for the encouragement from time to time of any person writing the best astronomical work, et cetera, et cetera. You know why, why the Jackson Gold Medal is, is awarded today. She died 22 years later on 1st of December 1893. Sorry, 32 years later. I'm not very good at maths. By January 1895, a subcommittee was formed to consider the nature of the award, the medal, and its commission. Its mem members were left to write spectroscopy pioneer Sir William Huggins, and you'll recognize his portrait, which hangs outside the library. Edward Walter Monder from the Solar Department at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. Professor Herbert Hall Turner, director of the Radcliffe Observatory, and the astronomer royal Sir William Christie. Rather uninventively, the committee initially suggested that the medal would be struck in silver using the same dye as a gold medal, with just on the reverse the name of the recipient and on the reverse, sorry, the name of the recipient and of the donor. Thankfully, the then president of the society, uh, Ainsley A. Common, would have known of it and uh, told the committee to look at a new design. And what I've been following through the archives is a very long epistolary debate punctuated by meetings with Turner coordinating their views. Correspondence kept in the archive reveals that Huggins' wife, Margaret Lindsay Huggins, was instrumental in these debates. A formidable woman, herself an astronomer, she also acted as her husband's secretary and turns out in this affair to be an eminence grise of sorts. While she wrote many of his letters on his behalf, she often enclosed her own views or even wrote John, uh, on writing jointly about their, both their opinions. Thus, on 29th of October 1895, Sir Huggins wrote to Turner about the designer and designer Expressing concerns about a subject design in a medal of small dimensions, they recommended the, ob the obverse should bear the portrait of an astronomer, either Copernicus, Kepler, or Sir William Herschel, noting that all three astronomers have fine, strongly individual heads. For the reverse, they suggested the designation of the medal, name of the recipient with a judicious and picturesque arrangement of laurel. Their consideration of a designer, however, shows them well-versed in contemporary medal-making. Margaret writes, a head on so small a scale would require very delicate modeling and in fact could scarcely be done except by someone accustomed to model miniatures. In this line, Miss Casella, who has frequently exhibited at the New Gallery and elsewhere, has been very successful. The letter continued. I think for the honor of the society, the modeling should be of the highest order, these words underlined. But she concluded with this warning. I doubt much whether at the low price created by the president, sufficiently good work would be obtained. <laughs> Not a criticism <coughs> on any other president here. Turner himself suggested a portrait of Caroline Herschel, while for his part, Mondo reiterated his preference for reusing the uh, dye from the gold medal. But that should a new portrait be required, Caroline Herschel would be preferable to her brother. He went on to reject the idea of Kepler and Copernicus, arguing they were both foreign astronomers, while the Herschels, despite their German origins, had been adopted as British scientists. Now that no one thought of John Herschel, here uh, portrayed by his friend uh, Julia Margaret Ca Cameron, remains a little bit of a mystery because by that point, of course he had been one of the founding members of the RS, but he was also uh, the most eminent uh, uh, scientist in his lifetime. But as it may, Caroline Herschel was a very daring, if pertinent, suggestion. And I'll probably tell you things that you already know, but childhood illnesses having left her discovered uh, disfigured, sorry, and her growth stunted, she had been deemed unmarriable and had been uh, become, in effect, the family's maid servant in Hanover until William rescued her from her fate and called her to England as his vo vocalist first and then as his assistant, polishing me metal mirrors and, as she evocatively put it, minding the heavens, recording William's observations and sweeping the sky in search of astronomical objects. Caroline was to compile for her brother a catalogue of 2,500 nebulae that she'd observed with him. And in 1828, she was awarded the gold medal of the society for accomplishing the colossal task of organizing the general catalogue by position 
rather than by class. And no woman would be awarded the gold medal again until Vera Rubin in 1996. But more than simply being her brother's amanuensis, she discovered no fewer than eight comets, became the first woman to be paid for a contribution to science and to be named an honorary member of the RAS in 1835 with Mary Somerville. Now, as the document capturing the debate reveals at item number three in the middle here, the consideration of a portrait of Caroline Herschel was in part inspired by the fact that Hannah Jackson was a woman and one can argue as well that the consideration of the artist being women might have been uh, for the same reason. Interestingly, one letter reveals that it was Margaret Huggins who rejected the idea of a female sitter. In a preamble, she wrote that, as a medal is not intended even preferentially for women, it seems to us that the portrait of one of the three astronomers mentioned in my former letter would be preferred to a portrait of Caroline Herschel, who did not herself bring out any advances in astronomy. She went on that if a woman were to be put on a medal, it seems to me that Mrs. Somerville's claims to such an honor are far higher than Caroline Herschel's. But surely on a medal of this kind, there should be a portrait of a master spirit, underlined words. I yield to no one in my reverence and admiration for able women, but neither Mrs. Somerville nor Caroline Herschel are as astronomers the equals of Copernicus, Kepler, or Sir William. If, however, Sir William were chosen, it seems to me that in such a case, considering the well-known admirable assistance Caroline rendered, it would not be unfitting to combine two portraits. And she enclosed rubbings from medals and the tracings of a cameo from her own collection, <coughs> showing both suitable three-quarter um, faces, but also a double portrait. She finally reasserted her connoisseurship on medallic matters, concluding her letter. I hope very much you will succeed in getting a really artistic medal. Nearly all our English scientific medals seem to me poor. There are beautiful collections at the British Museum which are useful to refer to by any worth suggestion as to treatment. Now, Margaret's view prevailed, and in December 1895, the council asked Miss Cassilla for a sketch design of a portrait of Sir William Herschel on the, other, on the obverse, a name of recipient on the reverse. While the correspondence and business was conducted by Miss Cassilla, Ella and Nelia Cassilla executed this medal together. Sharing a home in southwest London, they were well connected and actively involved in London's artistic and intellectual circles. In the mid 1880s, they had studied among the Slade girls as the female students of the Progressive Slade School of Arts were named <coughs> under the wing of Alphonse Legros. The French artists had introduced medal making into the school syllabus and initiated a resurgence of cast medals in England in the tradition of the masters of the Renaissance medallic art. The Castellers enjoyed success as medallists and modellers in wax and had exhibited at the Royal Academy and other London galleries by the time they undertook their astronomical commission. On 20th of December 1895, William Wesley, Assistant Secretary to the Society, wrote to Huggins, Yesterday, Miss Castle I called to see portraits of Mr. Herschel. He goes on to list uh, three portraits that he knows of, but observes, I scarcely see the slightest resemblance between these three. <laughs> if Wesley's dismay is palpable, so is the Castellers, who describes the three engravings as so utterly unlike each other. It was eventually decided to analyze the Herschel family as to which portrait they consider by tradition to be the one which should furnish material for the medal. Awaiting a suitable likeness to be sent to them, the Castellers made a preliminary sketch for the reverse in which they responded straightforwardly to the suggestion of an inscription and laurel. The design they sent the committee via the Huggins's is conventional if beautifully composed. They also enclosed an example of their Charcot medal to give you an idea of the treatment of the head, she, they said, a gesture that had a crucial impact on the progress of the commission. As a particularly fine example of their modeling and fine lettering, showing their inspiration from what was in terms of medieval style of Pisanello's medal, it functioned as a demonstration of their skill to the committee. Her imagination fired. Margaret Huggins could not help but write again. 
My husband and I both much admire the medal Miss Kessler has lent, and eyes of the sketches for reverse would work. They would work well. But from the first, I have groaned in spirit of the small size proposed for the medal. The small size is, I know, inevitable under the circumstances if the medal must be silver, but must it? Why not have a bronze medal? No metal gives such thoroughly artistic results. I venture to press the idea of a bronze medal of about the size sent by Miss Cassella upon your consideration. You could then have a beautiful, underlined word, portrait of Sir William Herschel. And you might have, too, a more interesting reverse than has been suggested so far. The medal as a whole might well be, if in bronze and of a fair size, a work of art worthy of the society. Now, this is important on several points. First, the focus on artistry, the medal considered as a work of art as well as an award. Secondly, not only did the Charcot medal provoke the desire for a change of medium, but also a change of size. The latter incited Margaret Huggins to propose a different reverse from that originally intended, for it would now allow for a subject composition rather than simple inscription and decorative feature. A larger medal would impact on the cost of the model, but this increase, the castle has suggested, could be alleviated by casting rather than striking, so saving on the cost of making a die. Casting was deemed important by the Hugginses in order to render the work of Miss Kessler in a suffici sufficiently good and artistic manner, so medals thus becoming more akin to sculpture than it would be to a medal. These matters required face-to-face -face conversation, and the sisters, I quote, summoned sufficient courage to face so formidable an assembly at Burlington House in February 1896. And I know how they felt. <laughs> Matters of size, three inches, material, bronze, and technique casting were finally settled. The castellers were finally supplied with William James Herschel's photographs of his grandfather, aged 49, in a 1787 bust by John Charles Lucky. And I'm showing you the corresponding Wedgwood medallion as well, which they used as a model. Finally, it was decided that the reverse should show an allegorical subject that would reflect Herschel's significant contribution <coughs> to astronomy. He'd shot to astronomical fame for, uh, for uh, Uranus, the first planet to be discovered since antiquity. His indefatigable sweeping of the visible sky and study of deep space subjects was already evoked on the gold medal. So it seems fitting that the new medal would concentrate on our solar system. Among Herschel's other achievements was the discovery of two of Saturn's moons. And Margaret uh, Huggins had also suggested that an important astronomical device might be a principal feature. In the designs of the unfinished state submitted to Turner for consideration to the committee in April 1896, a figure of Urania is camped atop the globe of the Earth holding an armillary sphere against a starry sky. Nelia Cassada wrote widely, I have no doubt you will laugh at the suggestion of the stars and planets on the reverse. Of course, they're all wrong. Would you kindly let me have a sketch of something correct to put in place of my absurd and imaginary planets? So Huggins's, of course, had thoughts to contribute. Enclosing a tracing from a portrait of Herschel set against a telescopic view showing the position of the stars on the night he discovered Uranus, they reflected that the medal too could figure these as a background to Urania. Now, I'll remind you the medal is three inches inside. <laughs> they suggested, and this is quite at some length, they make a number of completely unreasonable suggestions. So they suggest that two to four of Saturn's uh, satellites should be added, uh, provided that she be given, uh, the castle is be given the right instructions as to his inclinations and, and, and orbits. Uh, growing bolder still, they ventured uh, that a comet would be a charming addition. And finally, they said, if the group of stars is putting, this will fix the orientation, and then the moon and Saturn must be placed in possible places relatively to the stars in Gemini. One might ponder about scientific accuracy gone mad, reading the last words in the letter. If by, 
If by accident any object was placed in an impossible position, the committee would have to commit suicide in a body. <laughs> With much satisfaction, I now leave the matter in your able hands. Now, the satisfaction was not shared, and neither did checking the configuration of the stars on the day of Herschel's discovery amused Turner, whose handwritten comments at the bottom uh, read, some valuable time wasted in trying to identify this, finally gave it up. <laughs> His enthusiastic response to the catalyst shows nothing of this ex exchange. He says, your designs were submitted and much admired, and then he sends uh, some suggested minor changes on the moon and uh, on Saturn. A second wax was submitted uh, in May 1896, but months lapsed before they head back from Turner, um, who'd gone to Japan to observe an eclipse, as astronomers do. His next letter was a digest of a long series of criticism provided by council member Edward Ball Noble. These ran from the form and roughness of the medal, deemed unsuitable, unsuitably medieval, to the depth of Herschel's collar, the proportions of Urania, the presence of a handle or stand on the armillary sphere, the vermiform markings representing the Earth's continents, the positions of the artist's initials, and so on and so forth. Uh, needless to say, the castellers uh, listened to none of this. Um, of course, the Huggins's immediately responded to his criticisms, sending designs of armillary spheres, which they had themselves suggested to the castellers just to prove conclusively that the armillary sphere was fine. And Turner clearly also had very little desire to give in to uh, Noble's criticisms and, and to let the, the subject turn into yet another long debate. Huggins phrase about summarized his argument, and I quite love that. It's in a letter unusually written in capital letters as if for emphasis shouting at uh, Christie as he's writing to him. The medal as a whole is medieval in spirit, and the periphery is in keeping with it. In my opinion, the medal should not be altered in this respect. And he firmly concludes, generally, I regard this medal as a truly artistic production. Eventually, the council ruled out any changes but for the erasure of a teeny tiny detail on the armillary sphere. At long last, the works model was completed at the end of January and the first set of bronze medals delivered to Burlington House on 12 February 1897. <clears throat> With its powerful lettering, elegant simplicity, compositional monumentality and clarity of design, the medal reveals the artist's ability to translate the nature of a discipline and ethos of a society into something equally beautiful and inspiring, <coughs> an appropriate reward to talented recipients. Herschel's profile displays the gravitas and the intense gaze of a man whose life was dedicated to the scrutiny of then unbelievably far and distinct objects. While Urania proudly holding the, that most astronomical of instruments is almost mannerist with her elongated limbs and flowing drapery. The simplicity of the stars and celestial bodies, bodies reveals that clarity may be found even in the most unfathomable darkness of the universe. With its pisanella scandertones, but nods towards the future, the medal firmly places Herschel's as a true successor of the great thinkers of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, and its recipients as the heralds of the future. Now, if prize medals are about celebrating achievements, the medalists themselves often remain the unsung heroes behind their creations. It's remarkable that although the Gold Medal and Jackson Gilt Medal are still awarded to this day, as the RS most prestigious prizes, their design and designers, which prompted thoughtful consideration and debate at the time of their making, are now largely eluding attention. Mills, Wyon, and the Castellers are neither mentioned in the history of the Royal Astronomical Society, even if it was written by Turner, or on the Society's website, where the prize recipients are, however, listed in full. While it is to be loaded that new awards are still being created, it is perhaps symptomatic of the lack of attention and understanding medals receive as objects that for these more recent medals, the artistry that was so crucial to the Hugginses is now given little consideration. The Eddington, Chapman, Herschel, Patrick Moore, and Annie Mondo medals show the competent skill and quality striking of the Royal Mint and Thomas Fetteroni Limited. But these are literal mechanized transcriptions of existing portraits and did not involve designers. They have become merely illustrative of achievements rather than objects to be admired in their own rights that beg to be touched and proudly displayed and used as prompts for elevated conversation. 
It is remarkable, too, that except for the recently created Annie Monde Meadow, and the first recipient is uh, sitting on the second um, row of seats here, which commemorated one of the Royal Observatory's uh, female computers and a pioneer of solar astrophotography, women are conspicuously absent from the faces of these medals. As women in STEM are more and more celebrated the world over, it is to be hoped that future astronomical prize medals will both call for the artistic skills of outstanding medal makers and for the long overdue representation in medallic form of Caroline Herschel, Mary Somerville, or indeed Margaret Huggins and their celebrated successors. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So we have time mm, for one question, perhaps. Sorry. Everybody is stunned by the medals. <laughs> is the name of the recipient on the Jackson Wilk Medal or not? That's a very good question. Uh, Margaret Huggins, who was full of good ideas, suggested that it ought to be on the rim of the medal, which in itself is quite a difficult achievement, technically speaking. Now, I have only seen the uh, primary model of the medal in the archive, and I haven't seen one of the awarded medals, so if one of you has got his or her medal with them tonight, I would love to see if the name of the recipient is on it. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much indeed.